degenerative disc disease. Is it really a disease? Yesterday, I presented the case of a 45-year-old female who came to me with known degenerative disc disease. I'm gonna talk about how we diagnosed it and how we treated it. These are her plain x-rays, and what it shows is that at C6 and C7, this disc right here is a little bit more worn out as compared to the other discs in her neck. She has had neck pain for a number of years and has had physical therapy, chiropractic treatments, over-the-counter medications, and even injections into her spine with good relief, but all the symptoms would always come back. These are the x-rays of her neck when she's in flexion or when she leans her neck forward. And what we see is that same C6 and C7 disc moves appropriately. So in other words, there is no disc instability. It moves like it should move. It's just worn out. The sagittal view of her MRI scan shows a C6 and C7 bulging disc without any evidence of facet arthropathy when you look at all the other imagings, which I've left out. Essentially, what I am saying is that this woman suffers from a worn out disc in her cervical spine and has no signs of arthritis in her joints. I went through the anatomy of the spine in multiple other videos, but let's just do a quick refresher. We have the bones in our spine and the disc is actually the cushion-like material that sits between the bones in our spine. And when we flex or extend our neck or move our neck back and forth or even side to side, the portions of the spine that move are the disc and the facets, which are the joints in the back part of our spine. Here's a picture that helps explain that anatomy where you see the disc that sits between the vertebral body and then the facet joint in the back. Degenerative disc issues is a natural sign of aging, so inevitably all of us will develop it. After age 40, unfortunately, most of us already have signs of disc degeneration. Any type of injury that occurs to the disc can cause them to dry out or lose its hydration and water content within the disc, which will cause it to collapse over time. And here you can see how this disc is compared to a normal disc. Other risk factors for degenerative disc disease include injuries, obesity, genetics, and nicotine use, as well as jobs that require repetitive motion or increased physical stress. And women are more likely than men to develop this problem. Degenerative disc disease typically causes pain in your neck as well as migraine headaches with over 90% of people that have degeneration within their disc complain of headaches. Radiculopathy or pain that starts in the neck and radiates to different portions of the arm is also occasionally seen. That's because it can compress the nerves in your spine as they exit out the side. It's typically diagnosed by x-ray, MRI, or CAT scan imaging. Well, how do we treat it, doctor? I mentioned all the things that she's tried and those are all the mainstays of treatment, including chiropractic management, physical therapy and stretching exercises, traction, dry needling, cupping, medications, including anti-inflammatory medications, muscle relaxers, topical analgesics, and even interventional treatments such as injections like epidurals or facet injections. Exercising to strengthen the muscles to help support the spine can also help as well as stretching and hot and cold therapy. Quitting nicotine use can lower your risk of acceleration of the degeneration, as well as losing weight to obtain a healthy body weight. So for our patient, she's at the end of her rope and she wants to talk about surgical options to help her with her pain because nothing helps and this is impairing her quality of life. And like I told you before, one surgeon said that she was too young for surgery, one suggested a spinal fusion, and the other suggested a disc replacement. Which one do we pick? I have an old joke that I like to tell that if you ask three spine surgeons how you would treat a particular problem, you would get 10 different answers. And what I mean by that is there are as many ways to treat spine problems surgically. And how do we know which one's the right answer? Because sometimes all of the answers can be correct. I would argue that surgeon number one who suggested that she does nothing isn't really going to help her very much because she's already done everything and her pain is still there. I feel like sometimes saying someone's too young for a particular surgery is sometimes just gaslighting the patient into convincing themselves that they shouldn't be having this pain. And if you feel like you're being treated that way, get another opinion. Here's my opinion. This patient needs a cervical disc replacement. She's young and she only has one problem in her neck, a worn out disc and no signs of arthritis in her joints, 
which means if she had a new disc, all of her pain should theoretically be gone. Disc replacement is one of my favorite procedures because it is motion preserving. It means we don't really alter the dynamics of someone's spine and we preserve their ability to move each segment of their spine back to normal. A fusion is where we eliminate the movement of the spine and it can cause unnatural stress to the other levels above or below the spine and sometimes Fusions do not heal correctly. So how do we know if someone is an appropriate candidate for a disc replacement? Here are my criteria. The disc issue has to affect the levels of the cervical spine from C3 to C7. If you follow the FDA regulations, disc replacement can be performed at one or two levels. So if the patient has one or two discs that are affected, technically they are a candidate has to be an absence of facet arthritis that's contributing to their pain because if the facets are causing the pain then by continuing to move those joints the pain will not go away they have to have normal bone density so i check a bone density test on every single one of my patients whether or not they're undergoing a disc replacement or a cervical fusion because if their bones are not strong the implants will not hold how do we surgically treat it so we do a disc replacement by performing a surgery that requires an incision on the front of the patient's spine. We go in through the front part of the patient's spine and remove that disc and any bone spurs that are compressing the nerves. After we do that, when we place the artificial disc into position, it allows for restoration of natural motion of the spine. It's an outpatient surgery, meaning the patient can go home the same day of surgery, and it typically takes less than an hour to perform. We have restrictions after surgery for about six weeks where you limit the ability to lift or pick up any heavy objects. Then after about six weeks, you can go back to most normal activities. Here are our patient's x-rays showing the disc replacement that I performed at C6 and C7. And here is the flexion x-rays where you can see that that implant performs perfectly. She did perfect and she's two years out from surgery and feeling better than she has in many years. Another case of patient-focused and compassionate care. I hope you guys learned something on this one and stay tuned next week and I'll go through another case.